Good afternoon and welcome to the Vermont House Human Services Committee. Uh, today is Tuesday, March 8th. And uh, the first part of our afternoon um, discussion is on H711, an act relating to the creation of the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee and Opioid Abatement Special Fund. And a good portion of, of this, what we're focusing on is the section on the Advisory Council and we will be hearing from, I wanna say interested players, people who in fact do the work. And then we will be hearing from um, Josh Diamond, the deputy attorney general from the attorney general's office who was involved in the legal settlement and Monica Hutt, who's the chief uh, prevention officer from the governor's office. Um, so we'll start with uh, Grace Keller. Grace, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. I'm Grace Keller. I'm the program coordinator at Howard Center Safe Recovery. Um, for those who don't know, Safe Recovery is Vermont's oldest and largest syringe service program and oldest and largest dis uh, community-based distribution of naloxone. And most recently we started um, one of the country's first low barrier buprenorphine programs set in a syringe exchange or embedded. Um, so I come at it from the perspective of people who are um, supporting people who are actively using, um, people who are relapsing, and people who are in early recovery, um, and namely, unfortunately, people who are most um, likely to overdose and or suffer other um, may, harms that may, um, that other harms such as endocarditis where, that may be fatal. Um, so when we're talking about abatement, really my focus, um, unfortunately for all of my staff is really about keeping people alive, getting them into treatment, supporting them to stay in treatment. Um, but as a frontline person and frontline team, we really are seeing probably the most overdose deaths um, in the in the state. And really, I've been in my job for 14 years, so um, I've never witnessed um, overdose deaths the way we are seeing them now. And for us, we are a statewide um, organization because uh, they're, we're the only full-time syringe exchange. So people do come from all over the state to access services. We had somebody from Bennington in recently and I also represent um, Howard Center and Howard Center has multi layers of treatment and support for people who are using opioids. Like we have a hub and a, and a spoke, spoke has multiple different sites. Um, Safe Recovery is one of them um, and a social detox and counseling and all different layers of support. So um, I'm here also talk, able to talk about that and um, I'm on behalf of Vermont Care Partners. So I think that's pretty much a, a description of what I do. Uh, and really when I'm thinking about abatement, I really think that we need to focus, and I know everybody here does, on the people that, are, that, are, um, that we're losing. One of the things that's happened recently that's really hit home is a lot of the people that we've lost to overdose recently are parents. So also when we talk about prevention, um, the best thing we could be doing for the next generation is keeping their parents alive and getting access to treatment for, for those kids and those families because it's really been very devastating. And I wanna also highlight that overdose isn't the only way we lose people in this epidemic. Um, we had a woman call our office who was very close to us um, who struggles with a lot of things and she was having trouble breathing. My staff called an ambulance for her and she got to the hospital and was almost, um, dis was blue and, and very close to death from endocarditis. So <clears throat> really, I think that's what I represent sitting here is, is the people who are really meeting with and, and, and touching the, the people who are most at risk for, for fa fatal um, consequences of the opioid epidemic. I think that's probably a good start if people want to ask questions. Um, uh, Grace, I will just ask you one question. If you were able to look at the composition of the Opioid Settlement Advisory Council, Advisory Committee, and whether you had any comments about um, whether from your perspective, um, the voices necessary to be at the table were at the table. Um, great question. So I, I do think I, might, I have had a chance to look at it. I've had quite a bit of time to think about it. And um, I think we 
we are where we can, um, even with all the positions that aren't designated as such, we should really be focusing on getting individuals with lived experience and namely lived experience from opioid use disorder. Uh, I know in this state, we do a good job of elevating voices of people in recovery, but also trying to maybe find a way to engage people who are actively um, struggling and actively at risk um, and their families. So I think while I know there's a prescribed position that is for someone with lived experience, I think in, in, um, in, in the best way we can, making recommendations and prioritizing people who are living through this or who are in recovery is a really good um, way to go. And the people who are most at risk for dying are, are injection drug users, are people exiting treatment in jails, um, and are um, you know people who the system isn't actually engaging currently other than at certain service programs. Um, but there are quite a few people in the state that aren't accessing any services. So I think we need to find a way to get those voices. And I know that it probably seems daunting to add spots, but I think if we could be adding some spots really focused on the people who are doing the frontline work and the people who are, um, who are suffering in their families, I think that would be great. Or the other option that, um, and, and people who know me know that I'm not uh, really into layers of bureaucracy, but um, having maybe a panel of lived experience experts that could make recommendations to the, the committee where it's all focused on, on lived experience or some way to elevate those voices. Because I think, at least in my work, the best policy and the best work at Safe Recovery comes from listening to our clients, comes from having really good access to the population, um, and comes from really, you know, going through it with people. So I think we really need to find a way to elevate those voices as best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Um, appreciate, appreciate that. Um, why don't we go on to right now? Um, why don't we go on to um, uh, Peter um, Espen Espenshade? Very good. Yes. Great. Thank you all. And thanks for having me here today. I'm Peter Espenshade. I'm the president of the Vermont Association for Mental Health and Addiction Recovery. We are also known as Recovery Vermont, which is one of our core programs. We train the recovery workforce in Vermont. We advocate for those in recovery and we pilot and innovate new recovery programs throughout the state. Um, I've been in my position for nine years. I'm a member of the former uh, Opioid Coordination Council I'm a current member of the Vermont Substance Use Disorder Prevention Council. And prior to that, I worked at the Vermont Community Foundation doing grant making uh, in education and healthcare. I think more important than that for this conversation is I'm a person in long-term recovery. I was um, addicted for years to poly substances including uh, prescription opioids. I used to uh, be able to get as many opioid refills as I wanted uh, from my doctor. But uh, I know that you all have heard those stories uh, before and they um, have been too common. What excites me is the promise of recovery. And recovery is about now what? Now what are we going to do to move forward as a state in this case with this opioid settlement? And recovery is exciting. People do move forward. Recovery is the norm, not the exception. According to the CDC, about 75% of folks with substance use disorder uh, reconnect to happy and healthy lives of recovery. I think that the um, uh, H711 as it's written uh, is pretty good and strong the way it's structuring the council and the funding recommendations. Um, it seems to correspond with what we're seeing in the field, the voices of those with lived experience statewide perspectives on recovery, prevention, and medicated assisted treatment, which I think is paramount. 
some of the good talk we've already heard about from Grace and others on what we call harm reduction, um, syringe exchange, and uh, naloxone distribution, and putting all of that in an evidence-based and accountable structure. I think things um, are structured well in the bill, the way it's written. Um, and obviously we'd love to be part of the conversations moving forward. I guess my uh, two cents on things as they are written is I would recommend all of us to view the term abatement um, a little more broadly than we might conventionally. We see the term abatement throughout this bill. And at least in our shop, we view abatement as far less than sort of lessening the impact of something, but um, about lessening the impact of something on one's complete lives. So we're not talking about abatement simply of use of substances, but abating the impact of the opioid epidemic on our daily lives. And that's what recovery is all about. It's about reconnecting people to happy and healthy lives through things like employment, like the Recovery Friendly Workplace Initiative, through recovery residences, through recovery centers and programs. And I would uh, love to see this committee and these funds focused on moving the state forward by abating the past impacts of the opioid epidemic and getting these beautiful, hardworking Vermonters in recovery back into work, back into their lives, reconnected with families and reconnected with their communities. Uh, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection. And I think that this settlement and this council and these funds can um, be a nice step towards reconnecting us um, to lives that are better and healthier and more family and community focused. So thanks. And I'll take any questions now or later, whatever works for you all. Um, thank you. I'll just do a quick turn around the table to see if there's a question right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will get back. Um, and now we have um, um, Joyce McKeon, president of the Vermont Association of County judges. You might need to tell us what that is because you're not normally in front of us. Right. So thank you very much, uh, Chairman Pugh and the committee. Thank you very much for um, having me here today. Um, I'm Joyce McKeeman. I'm an assistant judge in Orange County, and I am president of the association, which represents the assistant judges. And uh, the formal name of it is the Associate, the Vermont Association of County Judges. Um, and uh, But we are the Assistant Judges Association. Um, just in, in case people aren't completely clear, assistant judges have two very distinct functions. And one of them is that we are the executives uh, for the count for county government, uh, sm small though it may be, uh, the two assistant judges, two per county, are uh, in charge of uh, uh, the county budget, and then we also have a judicial function. I'm not here today in regards to our judicial function. I'm here today to speak to the fact that, as the executives for county government. We are the individuals um, who were contacted by the Attorney General's office uh, regarding the opioid settlement agreement because as part of that agreement, certain um, subdivisions as they are in, as per the language of the agreement uh, are eligible for discrete uh, funds and 12 of Vermont's 14 counties are eligible subdivisions and as such would have been of, um, eligible to directly receive some portion of the settlement proceeds. Uh, Deputy Attorney General Josh Diamond, who I know uh, I believe is here today or will be, uh, contacted us uh, because the, the counties don't directly have a mechanism uh, to disperse those kinds of funds. You know, counties in other states have wide variety of functions. They may be running jails and clinics and 
treatment centers under their own umbrella. That doesn't happen in Vermont. Um, and so the state has asked the counties to turn, essentially um, sign over our designated portion of the settlement funds to be pooled with, uh, with the state funds so that they can be effectuated to the um, best use around the state. And the assistant judges agree to that and we're happy to do that. But we do have a vested interest in making sure that the um, funds are distributed um, widely throughout the state. We know that there is no corner of Vermont that is untouched by the opioid epidemic. Um, some you know, locations are more harder hit than others. And the assistant judges as a whole are not advocating in any way for some sort of equal distribution. But we're very pleased that the current language of um, the bill does include one representative of the assistant judges on the advisory council, um, which is something that we uh, very much would like to do. Um, I also want to say just quickly to the, uh, again, because I think assistant judges sort of fly underneath the radar. I don't think people know a lot about individual assistant judges. Assistant judges come from many walks of life. Uh, currently, we have three attorneys. We have former municipal administrators, uh, educators. Uh, we come from bookkeepers. We come from many walks of life. And as such, I think that um, there are any one of a number of assistant judges who could uh, perform as a member of the advisory council um, very well, bring their full life experience to that, and then also represent county government as, as one component of that. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. Again, I understand that we're sort of, uh, you know, not everybody knows everything that we do, um, but I'm I'm here mostly to say um, uh, to to express my thanks that the assistant judges were given a slot on the advisory council, and to let everybody know that we're fully prepared to step up, and I'm I know that we can find a good candidate for our position. So I'm happy to take questions now or um, at any other time. Thank you. Um um, Joyce, thank you. Um, we may end up having more questions for you and others, um, especially and um, um, as it relates to perhaps our 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 mutual misunderstanding or understanding about the um, uh, I'm going to call it the pot of money and which pot of money is being referenced in this bill, which then always brings me up to the question now is what's happening to quote unquote, the other two pots and maybe that needs to be referenced somewhere statutorily um, or, um, and that's probably part of a discussion that I'm seeing that um, Josh Diamond um, and um, Monica Hutt on the side here and I'd ask you to come you're, you get to testify now, and I don't know whether um, you want to do this in tandem with um, Monica or. <laughs> yeah, whatever is the committee's. Uh, whatever works. I, I have a feeling we may end up having a discussion. <laughs> Why don't I just sit here and you sit there? Okay. I'll yell. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Joshua Diamond, Deputy Attorney General, thank you for the opportunity today to talk about uh, H711. And um, I know I've been here before, at least remotely, giving you an overview of the distributor and J&J &J settlements. Um, I do believe that this legislation, with one small nitpick that I'll, I'll share with you, uh, captures the requirements that are needed. And this is really, as I understand it, to effectuate that third bucket of money. There are three buckets just to recap. One goes to our localities, our cities and towns. The counties were also uh, able to access that. But as uh, Judge McKeeman said, um, we've asked them to assign that over to the abatement bucket. Uh, so uh, that money could be used most effectively. Um, and um, what the settlement documents require, they don't really require for uh, the municipal localities bucket, 
There's a state bucket, as long as that money is used for uh, remediation purposes broadly, um, that's fine. But the, the mechanics of the abatement bucket are spelled out in the settlement documents and this legislation enables that. And most important is this concept that there will be this advisory panel that will give guidance about how the money should be spent and that the makeup of that panel must be in equal parts, both state representatives and locality representatives, which is a function of the settlement that involved many cities, towns, and counties, not so much in Vermont, but nationally, who were also sued and wanted to have access to some of those monies for local spending on projects towards opioid abatement. And so that's why it's there. That's why there needs to be legislation to effectuate that. And uh, we believe that uh, the latest draft accomplishes what is required of the settlement agreements. I will note that you have probably heard in the headlines that there may be a settlement with Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers. There's still some hoops that we need to go through to make that happen. But if all goes well, this framework could also be applied to those settlements as well, um, at least as written. Um, the one technical tweak that I have to recommend is found on page seven, uh, line 12. Um, um, is this the draft that is on our web page? Um, what is the time and date stamp of the draft? You're talking? This is draft 3.1 as of 3722, 7.46 p.m. Um, I believe it's what is on the web page. Mm -hmm. As opposed to what is my hard copy. <laughs> <laughs> and in the last and second sentence of that paragraph A1, it reads The opioid abatement special fund shall consist of all abatement account fund monies dispersed by the National Abatement Account Fund Administrative to the Department. Um, and I, I think we probably could live with that language, but technically, I wanted to let everyone know that the technical term for that fund administrator is the National Settlement Fund Administrator. That's the language used in the settlement agreements. So I, I offer that as a technical um, edit for your consideration. Um, Can you remind us of where that is? Page seven, line 12. I would, I would ask that um, Ray, you make a note of that because uh, legislative council has had to step out um, in, um, in terms of that. Yeah. So those are my remarks. Happy to answer any questions that you all may have. I'm sorry, Mr. Diamond, can you repeat that? The, the national- Settlement Fund Settlement. Administrator Strike Abatement Account. That's page seven, line 12. Yes. Lines three and four as well. That same page. Yes. So what's the proper term now? National Settlement Fund Administrator. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, That's what this is for. Okay, so every place are you suggesting, sir, that every place where it says national abatement accounts, even when it's just referring to the fund, should it say settlement? No. Okay. Only when it's referring to the administrator. Correct. Okay. Just wanted to be clear about that. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I um, heard actually from um, in the testimony from Grace was the importance of uh, connecting the, the, the importance in terms of whether it's the advisory council or who, how to elevate the voices of um, both, I want to say for lack of a better term, frontline workers, people who are on the ground, mm -hmm. as well as um, individuals who are currently um, Experience, who are currently living with um, a, a, a probably um, an IV drug use um, issue. And I'm wondering if it isn't as part of the membership um, 
under powers and duties of the advisory council, there is a shall um, shall consult with, and the, the mention there is of the substance misuse advisory council, which is the you know the structure within the Department of Health. But rat, and whether to then instead of saying and other stakeholders, in between there, somehow. Um, reference and Grace, I'm looking to you and to others, something more specific, you know, um, around um, people on the ground and and that. Um, Grace, would that sort of help you? Uh, would that yeah. help you? Would that address your concern? Yes, I think I think it would. Um, I just I just know that the best uh, the best programming and the best um, ways to help people is really especially in harm reduction comes right out of the people who are suffering. And I think unfortunately for us in Vermont with the opioid epidemic changing so much, looking at things like fentanyl um, and, you know, we're really losing people mainly to fentanyl overdose. It's not really any longer as much heroin overdose. I think we need to have our finger on the pulse of people who are dealing with it currently or very recently, um, because I think that everything adapts and changes so much right now and we need to be nimble and move quickly. So I do think that that does, um, that does, that, that is a, a good way to look at it. It's, I think, um, unfortunately, I mean, I, you know, I'm hoping we get to a place where the, the, we're not losing people at this rate, but it's, it's really uh, what's on my mind and what I think abatement really um, is, is where, where my mind goes is like, let's, keep people alive and, and get them into treatment. And then we can figure out a lot of other things. Um, but I've just, um, I've never, I've never had clients die on this rate at this rate. My staff is, it's, it's just absolutely devastating. And, and then when you're there for 14 years and at, with harm reduction, you know, because of the lack, there's no judgment, people come in and report in throughout their lifespan. So I hear their successes. I hear where they're struggling. I know their kids often or their parents and, um, and we're losing people, people who've had long-term recovery and are relapsing. And so during those dangerous points, I really think um, elevating the voices of the people who are at those dangerous points and the people that are, are, have the best access to them. Did you want to say something? I, I, uh, these are important policy considerations and I think it falls, you know, those type of edits okay. seem consistent with the settlement documents. Okay, okay. Um, 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 I guess, you know, looking, looking particularly, Grace, at you and Peter, if you have uh, ideas or thoughts about phrases or um, how, to, how to do that, I'm, as I'm listening to you, I'm going, oh, does that mean consult with organizations that do harm reduction, provide harm reduction activities? Um, I, I, I'm, I am thinking, and maybe I'm thinking erroneously, to just put in and consult with people who are active drug users won't necessarily get us what we want because they won't know how to find them. Uh, you know, so I would be looking looking for, um, unless, oh, <laughs> do we have, we have an editor? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Monica Hott, I'm the Chief Prevention Officer. It's so nice to be back here. <laughs> um, so Madam Chair, I might suggest that perhaps you use language like um, demonstrate consultation with individuals with lived experience. And then, however, the committee seeks to do that, whether that's through a program um, or, a, or a specific site or a specific organization, but it's, maybe that's just the way to make sure that we're making sure that that happens. Yeah. Um, that, that's a great, that's a great idea. And I think what, um, right now we do not have, um, our wordsmith, i.e. Um, legislative council, um, is not here, um, but will be at some point today or tomorrow, whatever, and um, to uh, throw out some ideas to her and have her connect. Um, but so one of your ideas is to say um, and demonstrate Co consultation with individuals with lived experience. And then I, I think it leaves it 
open in terms of maybe how the committee does that, but then they can speak to that directly in the in the plan. Um, I might um, I might offer what we heard, if not today, in some conversation that um, the concept of lived experience is very broad. Um, and that what I um, that if my brother, my sister, my neighbor, my spouse, that that is my lived experience, or maybe I'm a social worker and I work with, that is my lived experience. Mm -hmm. And I think what I am hearing from both Peter and Grace and others is that um, the lived experience is that the individual themselves um, is, is actively, um, or um, is actively e either utilizing um, or is actively in um, in recent recovery. Yeah. Because um, what some of what I'm hearing Grace say is that they're right now with some of the what is happening. Um, there are some tension points where um, folks are um, where the possibility of relapse is pretty strong. Um, yeah. It's great sense. It does make me wonder if a if a group like this already exists, and if not, why? And I kind of want to turn to Grace um, and wondering. I know uh, on the ground you're able to have that consultation with folks who are coming in and utilizing your services, but is there a community action group um, that has been formed around looking at substance use and especially the overdose crisis? Um, thanks. That's a good question. So there, it, it's kind of a interesting answer. There are, there are quite a few um, and there, you know, there, there's nuance to all of them. I do see that I'm in, a, you know, a lot of meetings, you know, there's a Comstat group for Burlington. Um, there's Comstat subcommittees, like I am the chair of the um, uh, overdose prevention site committee. Uh, there are state meetings. I'm sure that, um, we'll hear about too. There's an intervention treatment and recovery meeting that uh, Peter, I believe, and I both go to. Um, so, I, and I think in all, in lots of communities, there are, I don't know if there's an exact um, committee on really that specific population of people who are really right in the beginning of early recovery or who are actively using. Um, so I think that that's might, might be different. And, and, um, Representative Pugh or, um, is is correct in um, in that the, it, it's hard to find people who are actively using that feel safe. I don't necessarily think we have that structure set up in Vermont right now, but I think it's one of those things we need to change and really elevate those voices. Um, you know, and and I do think some family members, especially family members who have lost people, um, are people that we could focus on. So like mothers and fathers and, 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 and children, you know, really direct family members, I think would be, would be really good. And I think also not just to inform the council, but to sit on it, if we can, you know, look at those spots and really focus those spots, even the ones that aren't directed to be lived experience to, to get those voices in those spots and have, you know, multi point of um, criteria to meet that just so that we can make sure that they're, they're actually at the table. Uh, Cause I know a lot of people who would be willing to do that. Um, and then again, like you said, just people who are right on the ground with it. I think, you know, one of safe recovery statistics that I'm proud of, and I'm not saying that it would be us, but any of the syringe exchanges or designated agencies is that we distributed 59% of the state um, Narcan in 2020, and there are 84 other programs. So there are programs that are really on the front lines of opiate use um, and, and overdose. So just looking at that and looking to people who've been doing that work. Um, and like I said, it doesn't have to be me. I'm just really trying to focus it on the people that are touching people that are, are dying soon thereafter or um, and really trying to figure out how to get to that, that group of people and how to get that group of people to trust, trust our providers. And I think that that's something that we all need to focus on is who, who has that access. Thank you. And I see that um, Peter, you've wanted to step in. Yeah, I just want to want to echo what Monica and Grace were saying. I think this is an important issue that um, may need to be clarified in the bill. The whole issue of lived experience and who has it and who can claim it and whose voices should be at the table. 
The challenge, as you know, is substance use disorder is a chronic condition. Um, so we're gonna see different folks struggling at different points with their substance use disorder or their opioid use disorder. Um, and I think individuals with direct lived experience are crucial. I think the harm reduction community is crucial. And, um, you know, perhaps Grace and I can put our heads together today and, and provide some suggested language to um, clarify this point that we seem to be in agreement on. Um, that, that would be, we would, we would welcome that. And I'm going to put a time frame. <laughs> we hope to be voting this bill out. We, we, we're hoping that by tomorrow okay. at this time that we will have voted the bill out. Um, um, so, so we, yes, we want your um, ideas, but this is like, you know, final exams are tomorrow mm -hmm. and we need to do it. Yeah. Thank <laughs> Thank we you. got it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask something that I think is an important point of this to pick out as far as membership of the committee. And I'm looking at the latest draft. So it would be on page three, line 15, J, that it's now looking at two individuals with lived experience of opioid use disorder, including at least one of them whom is in recovery. Um, maybe that's something we've already discussed, but appointed by the governor. And I wanted to just kind of look at some of the other things we have. You know, the assistant judge is appointed by the Vermont Association of Judges. Um, the person with experience providing substance misuse programming is appointed by the Substance Misuse Oversight Advisory Council. So I'm just wondering if there's another entity that could be recommended other than the governor to, to appoint these individuals with lived experience. It might be hard to for, for the governor. I mean, I don't want to speak for, but I'm seeing a nod by someone from the governor's office that that might be a, a challenging. Yeah, I feel like that's a very reasonable question. And I, I don't know who to suggest to recommend, but I think that that makes sense to identify an alternate individual to make that appointment. Since we have a brief amount of time, if I might put something out there and hear people's feedback. Okay. Um, two individuals with lived experience, we've talked about the importance of recovery, people in recovery, and also people with current use. Um, my understanding is that syringe service programs have a lot of interaction with people with current use um, and that, um, I mean, I mean, Bam Har is with us today. I don't know if you feel comfortable standing uh, for, you know, selecting an individual uh, with experience who's in recovery, but I would potentially select those two organizations. I don't think there's a syringe service program coalition necessarily, but perhaps there could be a agreement there. We, we, we'd be happy to. So the second one, including at least one of whom is in recovery and based on what, and I will ask ledge council if it is needed, but I think um, we are not talking about in recovery from alcohol. Um, it says opioid use in the in the language. Lived experience. Oh, okay. And including. Okay. Two. Okay. Never mind. I didn't read it. It's <laughs> all good. But yeah, that's opioid use disorder is specified. Yeah. Okay. For a person in recovery. So if that person in recovery, if maybe um, the Vermont Association of People. Of, it's mental health and recovery. Yes. Um, and without, do you have individuals who identify as being in recovery of opioid use disorder? Ye yes, we do. Yeah. So all I have to, you know, and not that they have to be a member. Okay. Um, Representative McFawn, you have your hand up. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. 
Um, did you, you, you just said something um, and, and now, I, now I went out of my mind. So but I was trying to figure out how you could be in recovery and still use it. It's two different individuals. We're looking um, for one person. Okay. I mean, um, you, you people with lived experience, one of whom is in um, recovery and one of whom is actively using. Okay, and, and if, if I may ask, uh, and, and remember, I'm not an expert on this. What do we expect to get um, from somebody who is actively using? What, what, what constructive stuff do we get there? Um, I'll take a stab and then I might ask um, Grace and um, to and and perhaps I will ask Grace to respond first because that was one of your comments. You began with that. Yeah, I think um, you know with people who are actively using currently. Um, they, they're navigating systems and they have the inside view of, of what we're all trying to do here and helping people um, access services in, in a way that makes sense to them and giving people a menu of options that that might that individual might choose to stay to take to stay safer, but to also reach recovery. So I think really it, they are the experts um, in, in this system that we're all trying to trying to make happen. So they know what it's like to call a place and not get a call back. And they know what it's like to be really scared that they were gonna die because they might've overdosed. Um, but I think that, that that kind of, you know, and I think also thinking about other disease models, if we, if this was a committee for cancer, um, we would really want somebody who's on the committee that's suffering with cancer. I think that these are the experts that we need to look at. I see why it, it, it may, um, give people pause, but I also think um, when you work directly with these folks, they, they're, they're incredible resources. They're survivors. They've tried many different things. They pan the horizon for what's safe and what works for them. And I think that it's an invaluable, um, it would be an invaluable service. Or we could do somebody in early recovery, but I think, um, you know, either one, it's just more getting more people who are, who are dealing with the system. Cause we don't, you know, I've been in the system for 14 years. I've sat next to people who are doing all the work to try and get to recovery, but I have not been that person. And I think that that's really what we, what we really need to get at is, is what, where are our gaps? Where, where are, where is the stigma? Where are the shame? You know, what, what experience are people having? I hope that's a good enough, an answer that helps. Um, wow. I think from knowing these folks myself, they're just, uh, they're, they're just a very, very good resource for what, what we need. And they may very well be. I'm just wondering if we can't get that same information from somebody who um, is, let's say, still in recovery, but has been in recovery for a while, quite a while, um, uh, like yourself, Peter. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, I, I think, at least me, anyway. Mm -hmm. If I'm sitting down at a table and somebody's across from me, and they're high right now, and I'm and I get Peter across the table from me, and I'm not trying to cast any dispersion on anybody, but I think I'm going to get a lot more from a clear mind, in terms of what can be done, to somebody that's experienced it, got to that point, and uh, uh, I, I would say successful at that point in their recovery, as opposed to somebody who's um, taking the drugs right now. And I'm not saying that that is the best way to do it or, or not. Um, Topper, I think, you know, Topper, I, I represent McFawn. I think you raise a, a, a thoughtful um, point in, in terms of if someone comes to a meeting high, they're not going to be very helpful. Um, what we learned last year and the year before was that there were people who um, were not high all the time. Um, and in fact, we're trying maybe to, um, to get to trying to stop and couldn't. 
and couldn't because of barriers or couldn't because they weren't sure they trusted whatever. And um, so that um, there may be a both end, um, but clearly, you know, um, someone coming to or us relying on the um, solely on the um, input of someone who was actively high at the moment um, may not be that um, helpful to us, although it may provide us with some information as to why and what's happening. Thank you. Um, I saw, um, Peter, I saw your hand go up. Yeah, ju ju just to piggyback on the on the both and, you know, I think um, Grace brings up some really important points is that folks who are have at minimum recently been working through the system bring a really important voice. Uh, recovery is a, a lifelong process. It is a chronic condition. It is analogous to diabetes or cancer. And um, it's recovery is not a simple journey. And um, at minimum, it would be nice to possibly specify folks in early recovery. So we know folks who've, um, who are just entering into their, their recovery and who are intimately familiar with what they and their communities might need in terms of abatement and immediate services. Um, you know, re recovery, as we've been discussing, is, is not just sobriety, it's not just stopping use, it's that kind of reconnection to, a, to a, a better life that makes recovery successful, frankly. So, thanks. Thank you. And Grace, I see your hand up. And then, um, yes, I see Grace first. L lastly, I, I will just sort of wrap that part up. I, um, you know, I think that really it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who's really struggling with chaotic use right now. Like Peter mentioned, somebody who's in early recovery or tempting recovery. I mean, I think we also have people in the system that like, I think my coworker who's testified for your group is in 12 years of recovery. She waited two years on a waiting list in Vermont. She struggled with overdose. She's been in recovery a long time. She's interfacing in the syringe exchange with people. So I think we have a lot of different resources for people who are in recovery. And quite frankly, a lot of the people that I work with at Safe Recovery are in recovery. They, they um, you know, just stay with Safe Recovery throughout the lifespan because we work with people whether they're using or not. Um, but I think that's a, that would be a really good way to look at this is, is maybe early recovery um, or people who are most affected, also their family members. And I don't think it has to be necessarily just for these two positions. My hope would be that we're looking at each one of these positions to see if there's a candidate that has um, lived experience. Um, and, you know, even from cities places, I mean, I think we have so many resources and um, you know, I know personally parents who've lost kids that fought the system too, that went through the system and couldn't make it work um, and, and really suffered the worst consequence that we're looking to abate. So I think that's that would be my hope is that we are really trying to tap into this in every um, center that we can. Um, but we would be happy to be participating in that process. We do have access to um, the largest amount of people who are struggling with opioid use disorder, really. And so I'm, I'm happy. I know Peter said, too, that um, if you're looking for people, uh, we, we are a trusted source in that population um, and have good access. Thank you. Um, and Judge, you had your hand up. Sure. And it just um, a really small point. Um, first of all, I do want to thank both Peter and Grace for bringing their shared experience of working in the community here today. I think that what they've had to say is really valuable. Um, but I did the, the one small change I wanted to make was that I think that the language I somebody and I can't I apologize, I don't know who read it from the bill. Um, there is no such thing as the association of judges. So the language for the appointment of the assistant judge should be the Vermont Association of County Judges. That, that's correct. That's how okay. it is in there. All oh, right, sorry. good. I just wanted, I just wanted to make, sh make sure. Um, and uh, thank everybody again for the, for the good work that they're doing. It's so important. So thank you all. Thank you. And uh, Grace, that's, is that's your hand the bill. I'm sorry, Representative McFarland, what hand. did you say? That's My what's hand. in the bill now. 
It's the <laughs> assistant judge appointed by the Vermont Association of County Judges. Right. Um, uh, folks, um, I realize on our agenda, it says that we're gonna go to a different topic, but everyone is right here. And if <laughs> people can stay, it would seem to make sense Katie, for you to go over the draft and for us to do that piece. And I, those of you who are on, um, who, who came to testify, you are welcome to stay on as we go through um, the draft. But if you do not want to, please don't feel like you have to stay on. We really appreciated your, your commentary. Okay. Thank you. I need to go off to another court hearing. So thank you okay. to the committee and to all the witnesses. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, um, uh, um, Monica Hudd and Josh Diamond, if you can stay for the next, um, I believe we have um, uh, Katie for the next half an hour. Oh, three times. Oh, okay. Until, I mean, oh, that's an hour. hour. What? Whatever you need. Oh, thank you. My <laughs> <laughs> Um, Monica, could you move so sure. that the council could come? Uh. It just seemed like to break it up seemed silly. Hello. 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 Hey, Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Council. Uh, I have draft 3.1 pulled up on my screen. And I'll give everyone a second to catch up. So um, there have been some changes since the last time you saw the bill. I tried to really keep track of all the changes and highlight them in yellow so you'd be able to see them. And um, probably as you go through it, um, We've had some changes or some suggestions okay. while um, while you were elsewhere. So it seemed like a good thing to. Okay. So if you remember, this is renaming the existing chapter 93, treatment of opioid addiction, making it a broader title, opioid use disorder. Everything that had been in this chapter is moved to subchapter one, and we're creating a new subchapter two specific to the opioid settlement. The first section of the bill is a purpose statement. Um, the language, the first sentence is the same since the last time you've seen it. The purpose of this subchapter is to comply with any opioid litigation settlements to which the state or municipalities within the state were a party regarding the management and expenditure of monies received by the state. And this new sentence recognizes that there are multiple pots of money within the settlements and that what we're focusing on is the abatement money. So while an opioid litigation settlement may designate a portion of the monies for local or state use, this subchapter applies to only monies from the abatement accounts of monies. Can we stop right there and can yes. I double check something with um, Josh Diamond? Um, the fact that, that some of them, so, the fact that what the uh, assistant judge was ta talking about, about some of their money being put into the uh, abatement account is that based on this language is that okay yes that is consistent okay can i ask a question yeah um uh so the assistant attorney general spoke to the potential for additional settlement for the other lawsuit is is this language broad enough that it would cover both that's the goal um that it's a, a broad generic sort of language uh, and I'll look to Josh to make sure he doesn't have anything to add on that. So um, we're still working through the final settlement documents related to Purdue and Sackler. So conceptually, this is consistent with the settlement documents. Could there be a, a, a tweak that's needed by the time this gets to the Senate, possibly? But as it looks, it looks consistent. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next, that brings us to the top of page two. This is the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee. Um, there have been some changes in this section. Um, so I'll skip to subsection B, which is the membership of the committee. And if you remember, we have to have that equal split, the local um, and state representation. Um, so there was a new state um, representative added in subdivision F. 
a primary care prescriber with experience providing medication assisted treatment within the Blueprint for Health Hub and Spoke model appointed by the Executive Director of Blueprint to provide a statewide perspective on the provision of MAT services. If I may, this was a direct um, suggestion from the Medical Society um, as one of the groups who was asked to comment on this. Um, okay. And then next change is Subdivision J. I believe last time was just an individual with lived experience. So now Subdivision J reads two individuals with lived experience of opioid use disorder including at least one of whom is in recovery, appointed by the governor to provide a statewide perspective of living with opioid use disorder. We can this stop right there. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the appointed by the governor um, seems to be unrealistic. Okay. Um, and the, um, including one of which, one of whom is in recovery appointed by um, B-A-M-H-A-R, Vermont Association of Mental Health and Recovery. B-A-M-H-A-R. Um, um, uh, the um, individual with, um, I don't know what, whether it, it's sort of, should both of them be, be um, or, or they were going to, um, I believe, um, um, some of the people who testified, um, both from Safe Recovery and from BAMHFR, were going to perhaps provide us with an idea of who the second one could be. Okay. Um, and um, with, I, I have a wondering, um, there is at the beginning of this whole list um, of, of folks, a to reflect the diversity of Vermont in terms of gender, race, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, there was a suggestion that um, if at all possible, we not limit, it, limit the people with quote unquote lived experience to just those two, but that in consideration of some of the other positions that, um, and so wh whether there's any way of putting that in <laughs> the beginning. Um, Grace, you have your hand up. Is that a legacy hand or a new oh, it, comment? It might be. Um, but I, yes, I think it would be really great if we could pick one of them and have Peter pick one, because I think we do see different populations and we want it reflected in the population, you know, in the population that we serve. So I would, I would love to have um, uh, uh, help with that. Love to be able to help with that. If that's um, something you guys are amenable to, I think it would be great. Um, sure. We'll, we'll, we'll put that there I, I, in the second, you know, one by okay. BMH and one by Safe Recovery. Um, Representative McFawn. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, diversity and um, uh, statewide perspective. <clears throat> How do we, are we going to be able to get that by having these two agencies that are here now? <clears throat> I, I noticed that we had several other people that were going to testify, recovery partners of Vermont and, and, and others. Um, I'm just wondering, is that going to happen? I, I don't know, because I'm not familiar with either one of these. Um, I, I, will, I will ask Peter and Grace to speak to their ability to... Um, <coughs> Well, where are you located? I guess that's my first question. And, and what population do you serve? Okay. In what um, area of the state? I can, I can go first. Um, so Safe Recovery is located in Burlington, but we also just got a mobile van that will be serving Chittenden, rural Chittenden, Franklin, and Grand Isle. But since we are the only um, syringe service program that's full time in the state, we see people from every county in the state. We actually have a client. We have 5000 members. We have a client from every county in the state. Um, so we really are statewide. 
we oftentimes have people driving from Rutland and Benning, you know, we have some from Bennington even. So, uh, you know, we do, I think the last statistic I saw was that over 30% of our clients come from outside of Chittenden County. So that's something we would, and we could work with Peter to, to make sure that we're targeting different parts of the state for sure. If that's helpful. And, and Peter, you have your hand up. Yeah, we are a, a statewide organization based in Montpelier. We uh, place an emphasis on rural areas. We are now working in partnership with HRSA on focusing on 11 rural areas in Vermont with a uh, four-year focus on the LGBTQ community, the BIPOC community, and um, pregnant women who suffered from opioid use disorder and new moms and new parents with opioid use disorder. Um, many of those populations appear to be in this bill as well. That makes me feel good. I think you can fulfill the bill. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, top, uh, Representative McFawn, is your is that a legacy hand? I'm trying to get it down as soon as I can. Um, so um, I'm looking at that B1 still. So I think what could work, you can tell me if, if you like it or not. Um, and it would read, and shall reflect the diversity of Vermont in terms of gender, race, age, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability status, and socioeconomic status, and ensure inclusion of persons or individuals with lived experience of opioid use disorder wherever possible, whenever possible. Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. <laughs> and then, okay, so we were on J, um, J, and then K was um, the assistant judge appointed by the Vermont Association of County Judges to represent the local interest. And then in subdivision L, um, we've updated the number for local appointments to 10. Um, so with the 10 in L and then the one local appointment in K, that's 11 local appointments. So that balances out the 11 state appointments. Um, and I just want to, um, I'm sorry. Um, I, which has someone from the um, UVM, um, from the statewide perspective on academic research, um, we, uh, uh, Wendy, um, Forgetting your last name from um, the University of Vermont um, sent us an email um, saying that they were fine and that they in fact would be able to do that because they have some they have two in, two sort of institutes focused on research and um, she it's UVM and UVM MC so they'll figure it out. The only other change in that subdivision L is um, 10 individuals each employed by or an agent of a different city or town. So that's new language. I'm sorry, how many people are in that now? 10. Ten. It says, okay. So I thought we needed to have a 50-50 split. Yeah. So. Non-voting member doesn't count, but I, mean, um, I count 12 above. That's why. I'm count K, the county judge, as a local person. I see. Okay. So that gives the 11. 11 and 11. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I got it. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. And then there are some changes in subsection C, powers and duties. The advisory committee shall consult with the Substance Misuse Advisory Council and other stakeholders to identify spending priorities as related to opioid okay. use disorder prevention intervention treatment and recovery services and harm reduction strategies for the purpose of providing recommendations to the Governor, Department of Health and General Assembly. I'm prioritizing spending from the special fund. Then we go on to list specifically what the committee shall consider that hasn't changed. And we're gonna stop you right here, part of what you missed part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, what we were hearing from the providers um, 
from both from both Grace and Peter was the importance again the importance of people on the ground and the importance of um, uh, people with lived experience and so um, in addition to saying shall consult with the substance misuse advisory council you know comma and then sort of like um, one idea or, or somehow fit in what one idea Monica your idea was to um, I I think I wrote um, and demonstrate consultation with individuals with direct lived experience. That was one little addition to try to hone it a little bit more. And then leaving it open in terms of how the council or the committee actually solicits and, and collects that information. But I, but I didn't, Madam Chair, reflect individuals working on the front lines. I just well, we heard you say that. Well, yeah, I mean that, that. Those were the two things that I sort of um, heard from um, both in testimony today. That was important to elevate those voices, and um, so to sort of call those out as other stakeholders, kind of thing, and. Um, um, I, I think Grace and, and Peter, you have, you know, five hours if you have an idea, <laughs> um, but somehow to call out, you know, what I, I mean, I guess you don't say people on the ground, <laughs> um, workers on the ground or direct service workers. Direct um, support professionals. What? Direct support professionals are, it's a, a DSP is uh, often. Well, or, or frontline workers. Frontline, yeah. Um, and if um, nobody has an objection, it'd be great if the group of individuals that we're speaking of right now can be placed before the advisory council mm -hmm. as being the oh their order in this order. Okay, the, nothing, about, nothing without us. About right, nothing, nothing about, about us, us without, without us. us. Yes, right. if they are placed first, that would be. Um, and and Josh, we will make sure that. Um, I'll return in just a moment. Oh, okay. Okay, so just a list would be fine, but just order it. I guess I'm getting stuck on the demonstrate consultation with, if I could just say the advisory committee shall consult with individuals with direct lived experience, um, frontline support professionals, the substance misuse advisory council and other stakeholders just list, does that, does that meet what we're looking for? Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I think that um, perhaps the, the use of demonstrate was, yeah, strong. Um, trying to indicate some strength to, um, you know, oftentimes we get reports about things <laughs> that say, oh, we consulted with, and, you know, they talked to one person. Um, <laughs> and um, so I, I think that what we were trying to do is to indicate- Or, or sometimes we have a plan. Yes. We have a plan to consult. Plan to mm. consult and that. Um, <laughs> okay, so got think. it. Demonstrate consultation it is. <laughs> um, okay. So then in subsection E, the presentation section. So there is some concern that the settlement said um, that the advisory committee has to sort of directly present to the designated agency, which is in this case, the Department of Health. So this has been reworded a bit to make sure that that presentation is going directly to the Department of Health, but also that the General Assembly is hearing exactly what um, is being presented by the advisory council. So annually, the advisory council is to present its recommendations for expenditures from the special fund established pursuant to this chapter to the Department of Health and concurrently submit its recommendations in writing to the appropriations committees and committees of jurisdiction. I, uh, Go ahead. Oh, I just was thinking, I, maybe we haven't gotten to it yet. Wherever we... The National Settlement Fund Administrator. We have to change that. We haven't gotten that. We haven't gotten there yet. I, I was thinking like, <laughs> yeah. I, I started seeing an abatement, and then I'm like, oh, my brain started going like, and I'm like, okay. Representative Garifano will tell you about that when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. In subsection F, subdivision four, there is a change that you can't see. There is a sentence that said the committee had to meet at least four times a year. Um, but we already said it in subdivision two, they have to meet at least quarterly, but not more than six times per calendar year. So I struck that sentence. And I think that is it for the 4772. And that brings us to top of page seven, 
This is the designation of the lead state agency. Um, so this has the Department of Health serving as the lead state agency and single point of contact for submitting requests for funding to the National Abatement Account Fund Administrator. That's where it is. This is where the, and this is where the language. <laughs> so it's the National Settlement Account Fund Administrator. So National, strike abatement. Oh, just strike abatement. And then add settlement instead of abatement. National abatement. Okay. National, no, National settlement. settlement Account Fund Administrator. National Settlement Fund. Yeah, there's no account. Oh, there's no account. No, okay. I didn't have it. In Spanish. Madam Chair, can I bring us back to page six just very quickly? Yes, you can bring us back. That's why we're all here. Oh, wonderful. I'm just actually, this is a really simple question. I'm wondering about May 1st for the first meeting, just feeling the pressure of being March already. Yeah. Knowing that all of these appointments are happening, I just don't want to starting legislation that we're already off. I don't know how to we just, you, you just passed a bill that, that, that says a report was due March 1st. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't have it yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's one of my favorite lines. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think when that date was originally selected, there was the idea that we were going to be drawing down the money right away. And yes. now we're talking about having to go through an appropriation process. So. Yeah that sense of urgency with the May 1 date was to start drawing down the money as quickly as possible. And certainly the committee should meet before the money is given. I think there's mm -hmm. an information period, but just to say, Do you have a suggestion? Um, <laughs> um, I think, it, I, think it, I, would, I would think it would make sense for the committee to start meeting in the summer, because I think it would take some time to collect all this information and the feedback. So I think sometime in the summer is fine, but I just don't. So June 1st? Uh, July 1st, maybe. Oh, please. No one's here in July. You know that. For the advisory committee, that's true. For the advisory well. You're on it. And you're going to be on it. I'll be around in July. For sure. I, I'm open. I just think May is setting us up to fail to start. And I keep that in the What's the difference? June 15th? <laughs> June 1st is already split a difference between May 1st and July 1st. It's not like we can't start working on this already, right. really knowing what's coming. Yeah. March 1st. So I'm, I'm sure that the parties that we've been hearing from today will be thinking about how to Identify. Uh, you know, get representation and all of that kind of stuff. So, so we are saying... May 1st, June 1st, June 15th, July 1st. June 1st. Yeah, I'd go with July 1st just because yeah, it's the beginning it's of this uh, year. And it's, <laughs> things like that. And it's on or before. Right. So maybe we say June 30th. And then any time before that, because it's just the end of the fiscal year. It's yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sounds right. good. Go for it. Sounds good. <laughs> All those in favor of now, what is the one we're doing? June 30th. Honor before June 30th. Honor before June 30th. Raise your hand. All those um, opposed? Okay. Well, well I think honor before for June 30th. <laughs> I've been for them. Oh, what did you say, Josh? I, I, I defer to uh, the wisdom of the <laughs> <laughs> That's not very questionable. Oh, Topper, you have your hand up. The whole time. <laughs> uh, yeah, Madam Chair, it's, it's for two purposes. One was to vote, and the other is I have a question. Um, okay. The advisory committee, uh, this is on page five, line 17. It says they'll present their recommendations for expenditures um, to the Department of Health and then to the committees. Um, should the healthcare committee also get that report? Um, at this point in time, it is the committees of jurisdiction and the committee of health, health committee does not have jurisdiction of substance use. But of course, you know, um, maybe it's to say the committees of jurisdiction. No. Okay. 
I just I just mentioned it because the report's going to the Department of Health. And that's what an argument. And they report to us. Trapper. The Department of Health reports to us most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Except when it doesn't. <laughs> Except when it doesn't. And okay. Diva and Diva reports to the um, um, the health committee, except when it doesn't. I mean, <laughs> so, on this particular case, still report to us. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the question. You're welcome. Okay. So back to page seven. We've updated the administrator to the National Settlement Fund Administrator. This and I believe that's twice. It's on line 12. And is it on line three and four, Josh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Three and four and 12. Okay. Um, and then approved request shall be dispersed to the state for deposit into the special fund established in um, the next section. Um, I'm, I'm pausing because I'm thinking about the word state and I think we left it as department. Yeah, so I'm wondering if state dispersed to the state should be um, to the department because that's who's getting the money, line four. And I think that would be consistent with line 12, dispersed to the department. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if I had actually asked you to switch it to the city because I felt like that was how yes flowed. you did you changed it and then we changed it back <laughs> I have to move. Uh, you changed it back down below but did you change it back in this section so you asked for state right I did in two places one and yep and I only changed four. it in one correct so that's what I'm trying to correct now so I changed it on line 12 back to department and I haven't we changed it. your feedback, mm -hmm. but we didn't make it. <laughs> Don't you miss us? <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm going to move along to the next section. Before you do, before you do, Katie, Katie, just uh, can the can the department uh, receive directly these monies from this settlement? Yes, that's what the settlement directs. The settlement says that it has to go to the designated lead agency, which in this case is the health department. Okay, good, but okay, it, it says it has to go to them. And my point is, usually when these kinds of money come in, I thought that it would go to the state and then be transferred to the department. It's a small item. It's not a big deal with me. I just want to make sure we get the money. My understanding was it had to flow to the designated agency. Yep. Okay. Flow to the designated agency. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> And they accept it. That's <laughs> <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> okay. Okay. So forty-seven seventy-four, the special fund. Um, I see. This is the second place where the change has to be made with the administrator. So on A one, we're creating the special fund, um, and it's established and managed pursuant to language in um, Title Thirty Two and it's administered by the Department of Health, the special fund shall consist of all abatement account fund monies dispersed by the National Settlement Fund, National Settlement Fund Administrator to the department. And in subdivision two, the department is to include a spending plan. Oh, so the last time you saw this, we had this preliminary approval process. So this cuts that out. And instead what's happening, this is sort of how decisions are made and money is drawn down from the national fund. So the department is to include a spending plan informed by the recommendations of the advisory committee as part of its annual budget submission. And once approved, the department is to request to have the funds formally released 
from the National Abatement Accounts Fund. The department is to disperse monies from the special fund uh, pursuant to the process outlined in Title 32. And then language that disbursements from the opioid abatement special fund shall supplement and not supplant or replace any existing or future local, state, or federal government funding for infrastructure programs, supports, and resources, <coughs> including health insurance benefits, federal grant funding, Medicaid, and Medicare funds. So this just essentially says this is coming through the regular state budgeting process. Kind of. Yes, sort of like ARPA. Yeah. And then in subsection B, we have the list of what um, the oh, uh, Tupper, um, uh, Representative McFawn. Yes. I'm having trouble with these things on the bottom of my screen. I just want to let Teresa know that it's flowing. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Fon. Okay, so section B, this lists how, um, what the appropriate expenditures are from the special fund. And there is new lead in language to kind of qualify the types of, um, the types of expenditures and to specify that they have to be related to opioid prevention intervention treatment, recovery, harm reduction, and evaluation activities. And similarly, in subdivision B2, um, instead of just saying support for individuals in treatment and recovery, indicate from opioid use disorder, otherwise it doesn't have that tie-in. Um, Can I ask a question about yeah. that? Mm -hmm. So um, I, my one concern about that that one particular section is that, as Peter indicated earlier, there are individuals that suffer from polysubstance use addiction. And I wouldn't want any language to inadvertently eliminate somebody who might, uh, who might be receiving treatment or recovery services for both opioids and alcoholics. And so I'm just, I, I, don't, I don't want to parse words, but I'm just, I'm wondering about, about does it have to say from opioid use disorder in that one section when the rest of the, I mean, I mean, I think it raises a question I'm interested, um, Mr. Diamond, what do you think a lot of the directions that a lot of the organizations that we're working with are trying more and more to offer somewhat substance agnostic services um, and harm reduction and uh, recovery. And so would a sort of recommendation to go to one of those organizations, how would you necessarily parse out that this is for opioid specific funding? It's a, it's a question that I don't have the answer to. I think the settlement documents and sexual reflective institutions contemplates full-time diagnosis and that uh, Dollars for treatment of co occurring diagnosis is appropriate as long as one of those is tied back to opioids. So I think by having the lead in in, in paragraph B that talks about opioid, um, maybe you don't really need it to reference again in subsection two, but there has to be a nexus somewhere to opioids, but co occurring is, is recognized. So if I'm understanding it correctly, that lead in specifically saying following opioid prevention, intervention, et cetera, et cetera, should cover that any of the money is used. Because I, I even look to the third one, connecting individuals who need help to the help needed. Um, I would not want to have to put opioid next to each and every one of those, but making sure that it specifically is addressing that concern. Because I mean, that's, I mean, I just keep as a counter or whatever, I keep reading these, um, documents from the model opioid litigation principles for the use of funds from the opioid litigation and cautions based on how states misuse the tobacco settlement funds and everything they talk about is um, opioid. This is the, opi the overdose epidemic. 
Um, and so there may be co-occurring adorbs, but that, I mean, I think that covers, I mean, I think that is covered within this one when we talk about services and supports related to it. I think, sorry, I mean, that's, I mean, I think that that's, I mean, that, so I say that's my head, the way I look at things when we're talking about effective treatment. Um, we're not, when we're talking about effective treatment for opioid disorder, yes, there is the medical treatment, but there's also the social treatment. There's also the structural changes that need to, you know, whether it's housing or whether it, what, you know, there's the, all those things is, is what this money I think can be used for. And, and you're, you don't think that, and you're concerned that it narrows it. I, my, I was raised, certainly raised the question, feeling concerned that that one, number two there, just limited it a little bit too much because there are individuals who will most definitively be. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Right. It's the, okay. It's okay. Just being silent there. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. So take that out because yeah. it's already in the. Uh, already in the yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Okay. It's in one, two, but that's treatment of mm -hmm. use. So that's different, I guess. Okay. No, that makes sense. To me, what about other people? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there are no other changes in this list. Um, B2, I think, yes. And then subsection C, uh, in the middle of page nine, this list um, kind of goes on to give priorities. So subsection B sort of is an expansive list. This is kind of the, the scope of what these funds can be used for. And within that, subsection three says, excuse me, C says, um, a priority is given for these very specific purposes. And these are all pretty much coming directly from the settlement. So the settlement, and this is to both you and to um, Josh Diamond, the settlement documents not only outline this laundry list, but they say in this laundry list, then we have some priorities. I, I would not read the set of priorities as prescriptive. Okay. I, I think the language is fine as it is. Okay. I think the intent is that when the request comes to the settlement fund administrator, they're gonna to look to the list to make sure it's approved or it falls within the four corners of the subject areas and they're gonna release the money. I don't think there's going to be a uh, high degree of scrutiny as to whether it needs priority one or priority four. And if it's not within priority one to four, four, you know, that to four. I just don't envision that happening. And I, I hear that the priorities are not prescriptive, but I, I think back to testimony that we had before break and the worry about kind of this prevention drain and having that be in the priority section, but not having the prevention of overdose death be in our priority section. I feel like that is a, a primary concern, at least for myself, um, when we look at the overdose crisis here in the state right now. So not saying that uh, prevention programs needs to come out of a priority, but I would love to see the addition of preventing overdose death in our in our priority section. Is that allowable? It is in the section above. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I'm but would oh. prescribed by the settlement. I guess oh. that would be my question. Yeah, this is where priority. a ministerial comes in, but it yes. was already told us as a priority. BNC come almost word for word out of this settlement. Um, hence, hence my hesitation in answering. And again, I think with the advisory committee and the money committees and the committee set aside all conclude that they want to prioritize prevention of death as to where the first dollars go to uh, for related opioid. <laughs> Um, uh, contingencies, I, I highly doubt there's going to be any objection from the settlement fund administrator to making sure that the, that dollar one goes to those programs. 
I wonder, I'm sorry. To no, you go right ahead. I wonder if there's anywhere in the bill that we can reference that so we're not dependent on waiting to see if the advisory committee chooses to prioritize that, given that the prioritization that we have already is prescribed by the settlement agreement. Is there any other place that we can address the prevention of death? Well, it's, it's number eight. Mm -hmm. uh, no. Yeah, it's it's not no sorry. It's on page oh eight. um the okay. it's number eight on page eight line seventeen, preventing overdose deaths and other harms. I also but there it's just listed as a use of the money and not prioritized. Okay, I'm wondering in subsection C that lead in language priority. For expenditures for the special fund shall be given to the following. I wonder if there's a way to sort of weave that concept right in the lead in language as sort of sort of like overarching for all the priorities to um, come. Um, next question is how to do that. Um, well, and I think the listing of some of those early ones, um, the intent is to prevent overdose deaths. I mean, you know, it's it's listing out strategies for actually preventing the deaths as opposed to, you know, saying the language. Do you know what I'm saying? Like the, the naloxone stuff and um, the training for first responders. I mean, all those things are meant to prevent death um, without saying those words, I think. But I, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I mean, if there's a way to leave it in there. Um, I look to Mr. Diamond because I don't know if there is a way to. I, I think it would be, if he chooses to say in C1, uh, the prevention of deaths, um, I, I don't think that that would create a violation of the four corners of the. So. I, I would just point out that in the priority list, I was just going through each of the numbers. And the first one is in the priority section. The first one is, is um, related to naloxone, which is one of our most effective death prevention strategies. And then number eight in the list of priorities is around expanding syringe service programs, which is another really specific harm reduction strategy to prevent death. So I, I feel like it is very well Feel like that concept is well represented in the priority areas in addition to the strategies. I'm not sure if that satisfies what you're what you're trying to get at, but I, it is definitely there. Yes, and I'm not arguing that the strategies are not present. Um, yeah. What if we said something in C? Priority for expenditures from the opioid abatement special fund shall be aimed at reducing overdose overdose deaths, um, including the following, or hopefully something a little more artful, but that would kind of get us there. That would feel good for me. Yeah, same. Did you just say including the following, Katie? I did, but I'm open to it. A better... No, I, I like including the following okay. because that leaves it open to, to I mean, other, other things as research progresses, as treatment progresses, as prevention progresses, there are going to hopefully be other things mm -hmm. that get added to the toolkit. And the way this is, it just is a, a finite list because it just says shall be the following. So I like your language better. Okay. okay. Um, and then the other changes in subsection C were sort of, I think, editorial changes um, for correcting misspelling. Um, so, subdivision seven on page 12 um, supporting prevention programs. Um, the editors were unhappy that it didn't start with a verb. 
So I added supporting and I think maybe I had prevent instead of prevention. Um, and then in subdivision 7C, funding for healthcare provider education and outreach regarding best prescribing practices for opioids consistent with current Department of Health and CDC guidelines. So adding um, Department of Health guidelines there. I think that was it, that was it. Okay. Katie, thank you um, for, for doing the walkthrough and for getting some of our input. Um, <clears throat> folks, you all have seen it and so heard it and we'll be coming back tomorrow for anyone who can be in the, who any, um, I, I, tomorrow after lunch. Tomorrow after lunch. Yes. Um, and uh, Grace, Grace, you have your hand up. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure that um, our, my charge with Peter's um, accurate. So what you'd like to see from us before tomorrow is language about um, uh, consulting with lived experience. And um, that's sure. that's right. OK. And, and not so much about uh, our two agencies choosing. That's already in. It's more about engaging people with lived experience. Right. And yeah. if you have a different way, if you have a better way um, of saying it than, than what we have now come to that okay. would you know would take your um input okay thank you so much for letting me ask that yeah no no thank you thank you for your participation um as i said our goal is um tomorrow why do i do it's there somewhere it's on there somewhere um, um our goal is to take it um up after lunch um and so if um um Grace, if you and Peter could give something to Katie um, as soon as possible, but <laughs> um, 11, um, that would be um, great. And because she, what she might end up doing is, is showing it to us in two forms, and then we can make a decision. Um, so what I would ask um, everyone around the table and people who are listening is that the, what is now um, on our website with a few tweaks is um, looks like what we will be voting on. Um, there hasn't been some real substantial changes um, in it. It will be what um, pretty much what we'll be voting on. Um, as soon as we have a new, you know, a new draft, we'll make that available. But read it, read it with a fine tooth comb. Um, and if you have questions or comments, um, please um, provide them uh, to me. You can cut, you can email uh, Julie Tucker, J Tucker at ledge, L -E -G dot state dot bt dot us or a pew at ledge dot state dot bt dot us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Katie. You're welcome. And, and now you can get there on time. All right. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks everyone. Um, Thank you both. Talk safely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, seriously, you know, we're looking to you to look at this again through a, a fine tooth comb. And this is, as we say, the beginning of the process because it does have to go to appropriations. We will be doing an informal drive by of to um, government operations because there is a committee and they always have to see those. Um, um, and all of that will happen quickly. Um, and um, then it goes to the Senate. Uh, I am presuming that this will be a bill that will pass both the committee and the House. So um, that, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It looks great. Pleasure working with you. Thank you. Um, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Grace and Peter. Thank you for bye -bye. having us. Bye -bye. Okay. I am. Bye. Um, committee, it is only three o'clock. Um, um, I want to say let's take a short break. And then um, with, with the help of my friends, I will, um, we will go over what we have thus far as a draft of the reach up bill. And we will do that um, because tomorrow, um, 
in preparation for tomorrow, which is where, um, so let me, let's take a 10 minute break and we'll come back and we will get to our reach up. Um, uh, Topper, we're gonna take a 10 minute break and then come back and talk about reach up. 